weekly webinar hosted, uh, sorry, organized by the College of Physicians Malaysia. So theme of the month is uh, gastroenterology and hepatology. And we are very fortunate to have uh, with us Dr. Tan Karchun. He's a gastroenterologist and hepatologist from Hospital Selayang. But just a few words for, about Dr. Tan. He, he obtained his MRCP UK in 2013 and completed his gastroenterology training in 2022. He has uh, presented on uh, key topics and published papers at both national and international level. He has special interest in interventional gastroenterology, namely EUS and ERCP. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Tan. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes Katrin. Loud and clear. Thank you, College of Physicians of Malaysia, for the invitation. <coughs> and good afternoon, everyone. Actually, today it is my great pleasure that I welcome you to today's insightful section on non-surgical jaundice. Our distinguished speaker need no elaborate introduction in the medical community, but it is my honor to present Dr. Chua Ki Hwat. He serves as an associate professor in gastroenterology and hepatology in UMMC, a testament to his exceptional contribution to the field. And Dr. Chua's extensive research is reflected in numerous published papers in the arm of gastroenterology and hepatology further solidifying his standing as a leading expert in this field. So without further ado, please join me in the extending warm welcome to accomplish Dr. Chua Ki Hwat. And Dr. Chua, now the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan, for your kind introduction. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, Thank you very much uh, to every one of you uh, to spend a, you know, a, a lovely afternoon uh, with us. Hopefully, I can share uh, some of our knowledge uh, you know, for the benefit of uh, you all. Okay. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about non-surgical jaundice. All right. So this is my uh, outline. So Dr. Kelvin asked me to talk about gastro-related topic and asked me to talk about non-surgical jaundice. I mean, to us, huh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Tan also may agree with me, non-surgical jaundice uh, maybe is considered as sort of like misnomer. You know, uh, medical jaundice is like pre- and intrahepatic jaundice. Uh, surgical jaundice is considered sort of like post-hepatic or obstructive jaundice. Why I say that probably means normal is because, you know, surgical jaundice is sort of like all this uh, require only surgical intervention, surgical management. Is it true? Um, is it like everything is very clear cut, differentiate between surgical and also medical? Um, later, I'll show you some of the cases. Uh, as in why do I say that, you know, sometimes it can be deceiving. Okay, so these are the cases that okay. Um I don't know why I've recorded this before. Okay, so uh can can you see my image? Yes, we can. All right. So actually these are the real cases that I've done uh not too long ago. These are US image. Uh you can see uh you know, these are the dilated uh, CBDs uh, with uh, CBD stones in, as shown in the red arrow. Okay, these are the ERCPs. You know, subsequently do an ERCP and remove the stone. These are the cases of, you know, uh, cholidocolithiasis with ascending cholangitis, which the surgeon referred to us. So whether is it truly surgical uh, jaundice managed by the surgeons only? Actually, uh, you know, a lot of us like gastroenterologists, like even Dr. Tan has special interest in doing all these EUS and ERCP. So not truly uh, surgical related jaundice only. Like this case also, surgeon referred to us after patient noted to have uh, jaundice, then uh, CBD dilated. So asked us to do ERCP, which uh, done. 
and can see that there's a proximal uh, CBD strictures which uh, we have put in a stand and do a cytobrush and this is clinically suspicious of cholangial carcinoma. Of course, also uh, need a CT scan uh, to, to, to have a roadmap of this case. Then, uh, you know, pancreas. I think I've recorded this before the last time. This is also another case whereby surgeon referred to us uh, to biopsy the pancreatic head uh, tumor. There's a presence of dilated CBD and which we have biopsy. And this is non-surgical candidate because already has metastasis. So this patient require, uh, you know, chemo, uh, immunotherapy, uh, radio, uh, radio, uh, chemotherapy. So is it, that's why, um, whether should we label it as surgical jaundice or non-surgical jaundice? Or maybe we just mention it as a pre-hepatic, hepatic or post-hepatic jaundice. Okay. Let's talk about pathophysiology of jaundice. So uh, we will start with, you know, breakdown of the hemoglobin, you know, uh, to form heme and globin. Heme will be converted to biliverdin uh, and subsequently will be converted to, to unconjugated bili, uh, bilirubin by this biliverdin reductase uh, in liver. Then it will be con conjugated uh, to conjugated bilirubin, which will be uh, water soluble. Then it will be excreted as a bowel into the intestine, and in the intestine will be, uh, you know, converted uh, into urobilinogen and stercobilin, which will be passed out in the feces. Certain urobilinogen will be uh, recirculated back to the circulation, and some of it will go in back into the uh, liver and certain part will be excreted into the kidney as a urinary bilinogen. So uh, back to uh, jaundice, usually, uh, I mean, we have to be organized in medical field. We always have to be organized uh, so that we can, you know, identify the causes much easier, can help us to, you know, um, mm, you know, gather our thoughts and, you know, usually jaundice, we will need to uh, separate it into prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. Prehepatic mainly predominant are uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubin. Um, unconjugated hyperbilirubinia can be caused by uh, increased production. For example, increased breakdown of the hemoglobin into heme and also bilirubin. So uh, they will then the conjugation. Um, in the liver mechanism is overwhelmed and they cannot cope with conjugating the bilirubin uh, fast enough. That's why we'll have uh, overwhelming unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. This happened in the case of hemolysis, ineffective erythropoiesis, uh, etc. Whereas uh, there are some cases whereby there's decreased conjugation. It happens uh, as a you know genetic related disease, autosomal recessive one. Commonly, we can see in Gilbert syndrome can occur in sometimes up to ten percent of the population. Um, hepatic cause uh, it can be mixed picture of conjugated and unconjugated, and there are uh, various causes which later on uh, in this uh, webinar I'm going to focus on this uh, that uh, hepatic hepatocellular cause of jaundice. In uh, post-hepatic uh, jaundice, they are caused by all these obstructive causes um, due to the duct dilatation, uh, due to the biliary obstruction causing duct dilatation. It can happen, uh, it, it usually you will divide into painless or painful uh, kind of jaundice. Painful jaundice usually are related to uh, stones, uh, colitocal litiasis, and sometimes they, they cause, uh, you know, uh, Ascending cholangitis, you know, or pain, painless one, you know, malignancy, uh, mat, uh, pancreatic, uh, pancreatitis, or, or etc., or even cholangial CA, or, or, or so. But of course, in certain patients, uh, especially elderly patients, or certain patients, they may have only subtle abdominal pain, and you all have to be cautioned not. To underestimate the, the possibility of post hepatic uh, jaundice. 
so uh, further to to differentiate uh, the causes of hyperbilirubinemia, if hyperbilirubinemia is isolated without any abnormality in liver function test, in those with predominantly unconjugated, you have to think of hemolysis cause again, hematological cause, or even Gilbert syndromes. In those isolated, completely normal, predominantly conjugated, that will include all those synthetic function normal. In other words, all the albumins are normal, okay, uh, you know, uh, their INR is normal. Then it could be something like a congenital causes like uh, Dubin-Johnson or Rotor syndrome. In those with abnormal uh, liver function tests, always we want to think whether could this be a hepatocellular pet, uh, causes or cholestatic pet, uh, causes. In terms of how do we differentiate it clinically as well as uh, you know investigation? So in prehepatic, uh, it's due to, as, as mentioned earlier, due to the hemolysis leading to excess production of unconjugated bilirubin. Mainly it will be unconjugated. The urine uh, bilirubin uh, will be absent. As you know, unconjugated bilirubin usually they are not water soluble, so usually not absorbed into body and, uh, and excreted into urine. The urine uh, urobilinogen uh, will be increased, uh, as mentioned earlier in the in the cycle. INR will be normal. Adrenal features will you will see a uh, hemolysis picture in the PDF, uh, reticulocytosis, low heptoglobin and low hemoglo uh, low HP. Into in the hepatocellular uh, jaundice, then uh, it could be due to the deficient uptake, or uh, uh, problems with the conjugation and attrition of hepatocyte. So usually it will be a mixed type of uh, uh, serum bilirubin, both conjugated and unconjugated. Urine bilirubin will be raised. Urine urobilirubin is variable. Uh, you know there will be marked increase in ALT and ASD. INR. Uh, usually in, in those with liver failure, whether acute liver failure, acute or chronic liver failure, or even decompensated liver cirrhosis, the INR usually is not correctable by iron, uh, vitamin K. In the obstructive cause, uh, it will be deficient in the excretion due to obstruction in the biliary tract. So predominantly, it will be conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, urine bilirubin will be present. Neurobilirubinogen will be absent. Um, a lot of time is because uh, the vitamin uh, the abnormality of INR can be corrected by vitamin K, and a lot of time the ALP is raised, and yeah. Uh, just a brief guide on how do we differentiate whether this is a you know hepatocellular or cholestatic kind of a, a liver injury, so it will be disproportion elevation of the ASD LT as compared to ALP. In cholestatic injury, there will be more of elevation of ALP. Mixed pattern of injury will be, you know, elevate in both ALP, ASD, and ALT. Then you may want to consider to use the R ratio, whereby you use a formula of ALT value divided by ALT upper limit, divided by ALP uh, value over the ALP upper limit. If the ratio is more than five, Five is defined as hepatocellular injury. Less than two, cholestatic injury. Two to five is mixed pattern. Although this serves as a guide, I'm sure we've seen a lot before. Uh, not all the cholestatic picture will present as such. You know, sometimes the ALT will be, you know, during especially, a, a, you know, severe cases of ascending cholangitis, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ALP may not raise as fast, you know, sometimes it's just they can, can cause all these hepatitis first. It can be, you know, ALT uh, raise uh, first, then subsequently also uh, only the ALP will raise uh, subsequently. So clinical suspicion is uh, uh, of, you know, cholestatic is also important. Next, uh, I would like to talk about the hepato, uh, hepatic jaundice. So it can be caused by many causes, like even malignancy, like the tumor infiltration of the liver metastasis or primary hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, metabolic causes, systemic causes, uh, 
and infectious causes, which is the most common, uh, even viral infection, uh, bacterial, parasitic, fungal, or toxic. Okay, so probably uh, just to focus on certain uh, that is more common in our uh, community, uh, in our region, as you can see, um, you know, viral hepatitis B, C, and if acute uh, causes, even hepatitis A. So usually we shall send a HBS antigen, anti-HCV, and Hep A IgM. So uh, next more common one uh, of those that cause jaundice will be, you know, medication. Uh, so detailed history of medication is important. Uh, alcohol is important. History of alcohol. Then uh, autoimmune causes uh, can occur as well. You know, um, usually our first line to send for autoimmune is DNA, IgG, and DSM antibody, and even consider liver biopsy. Primary biliary uh, cholangitis, uh, usually AMA, uh, is the test uh, to confirm it. Then primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, is the MRI, MRCP uh, to diagnose it. Then Wilson disease can occur as well. Uh, so send for serum, serial, plasmin, 24-hour urine copper. Uh, hemochromatosis, whether it's primary or secondary. So send for iron studies, look for the ferritin, desaturation. You know, uh, but carry sometimes can proper, uh, happen in a, with a triad of, you know, ascites, hepatomegaly, and pain. So ultrasound doppler of the hep uh, hepatic vein is important. Then, uh, quite commonly, we also see, you know, uh, cardiac causes like severe heart failure, you know, cardiac cirrhosis or, or whatever. They also can cause all this uh, he uh, hepatocellular kind of jaundice. If, of course, malignancy, you will, you will need a CT scan, CT uh, phasic uh, scan for the liver or even CT TAP for other causes of metastasis and, and, and even lymphoma and etc. Sometimes you may even need to do a liver biopsy. In conjug uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinia, intrahepatic disorder like uh, hepatocellular damage and intrahepatic cholestasis, in viral hepatitis, is this sort of like a brief pathophysiology. Uh, uh, viral hepatitis, the oxidative stress within the hepatocyte leading to self-death, scarring, and the de uh, diminished liver mass available for normal function. In chronic alcohol consumption, the steatosis, fatty liver disease, they can cause direct hepatocellular damage uh, from the ethanol metabolites and also from alcohol effect on the bile acid uptake and secretion leading to the cholestasis. So in other words, they can cause uh, steatosis, fatty liver, and they can cause direct uh, hepatocellular damage from the alcohol per se or even cause cholestasis due to the uh, you know, bowel acid uh, secretion and uptake. DD, which is one of the common causes of uh, jaundice as well, especially the hepatocellular jaundice, can be either a direct hepatocellular toxicity and activation of the immune response or inhibiting bilirubin transport into cannuliculi, which cause cholestasis, mucin disease, so loss of the function of the cellular transporter responsible for moving the dietary copper into the liver cannuli, cannuliculi, causing elevated liver copper level, and that affect the hepatic lipid metabolism, which leads to steatosis and also cholestasis. Having said that, Wilson disease are also associated with non-immune related hemolytic uh, hemoly uh, hemolysis. So sometimes they may have uh, the, the component of unconjugated bilirubin. We truly have a case before whereby, you know, we, that, uh, we have a case of like a uh, sort of like acute or chronic liver failure or acute liver failure of Wilson disease, which we didn't know. Uh, he, he, was, he, uh, he, was, he has no comorbid and quite a young patient, 20 plus patient, years old. Then he had a jaundice, mainly unconjugated. He had some only mildly deranged uh, liver function test. So we have referred to hemo hematology. Um, we have did a PBF. It shows there are some hemolysis which is not immune related. 
uh, liver function is like just maybe 100 plus or 200 like that, not really very, very high. So initially, we didn't suspect of Wilson disease. We thought of just hemolysis uh, that re require uh, hematology input. But subsequently, we, you know, we think and we, we look into the case and investigated and truly enough, uh, it turned out to be Wilson disease after we have you know done the uh cellulose you know then the twenty four hour copper, uh and even I think we did a little biopsy for the patient if not mistaken, and subsequently after treatment with penicillin and all actually patient uh turned out well you know. Then autoimmune disorder can be quite common also especially among the females and those with other autoimmune disease. So autoimmune hepatitis uh, or even uh, primary biliary cirrhosis. Uh, so uh, PBC is also autoimmune related, but it mainly cause destruction of small and medium bowel, duct, uh, bowel ducts. Whereas in PSC, mainly they are cholestasis uh, uh, jaundice, but uh, we can see some uh, you know, it characterized by inflammation, fibrosis, and cholestasis. So persistent injury of the cell lining of the bowel ducts, you know, they, if you do a little biopsy, can cause onion skin appearance. But the diagnosis by right should be uh, MRCP. MRCP is the gold standard. And PSC is commonly associated with ulcerative colitis. Just briefly uh, talk about uh, should just talk about the, the patterns of uh, patients with uh, ASD ALT derangement. What who are the cases whereby the ASD will elevate more than AST? Uh, AL, AST will be elevated more than ALT. Uh, for example, there are alcoholic liver disease and even cirrhosis. Usually, the ASD is more than ALT. Ischemic causes, huh? ischemic hepatitis congestive uh, hepatopathy, congestive heart failure, lah. severe heart failure that, that and causing all this ASD usually will be higher. Then acute blood carry, hepatic artery damage, uh, thrombosis, occlusion, and TBM. Uh, for others, generally ALT is more than ASD, including NAFOD or nowadays we call it as NAFOD viral hepatitis, uh, acute or chronic one, medication induced, uh, toxic hematochromatosis, autoimmune Wilson, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and, and, and the rest, uh, including uh, pregnancy-related uh, problems, usually uh, ALT more than AST. So I have uh, several cases to share, which are true cases that we have seen. Uh, we have this Miss I-28, Eight-year-old lady who was previously well was diagnosed with smear negative PTD, was started on accurate four for six weeks. Complain of yellowish discoloration of the eyes, jaundice for uh, lethargy and vomiting for a week. Presence of uh, jaundice, flapping tremor, no other stigmata of chronic liver disease, and no ascites. So the bilirubin is really high, 330. AST LT is more than 1000. I are also deranged. Ultrasound, there's no biliary obstruction. You know, viral screen, all are negative. Viral hepatitis. So, this patient is diagnosed with acute liver failure secondary to DV. Okay, so now I would like to talk about acute liver failure. So, this is uh, from ESA guideline, which is the European uh, guidelines of the uh, liver. Uh, which are one of the main guidelines, lah, either the European, American, or Asia Pacific guidelines. So, uh, definition and clinical cause of acute liver failure. Uh, acute liver failure is very highly specific, although it's rare, but it can have acute deterioration of liver function and the mortality will be high. So, uh, uh, you know, urgent action has to be taken, you know, um, to address it. Uh, you know, try to identify the etiology, um, start a uh, possible medication that may help, and 
need to watch out for uh, you know worsening condition and even need to refer uh, to a hepatology center urgently and they really may even need to work out for liver transplant. So definition of severe acute liver injury are those with, without any chronic liver disease and the liver damage usually the ALTSD will be very high and they may have a uh, impact uh, liver function, the synthetic function, like jaundice and coagulopathy. The presence of uh, hepatic and cephalopathy, then uh, it will be actually acute liver failure already, rather than just acute liver injury. So uh, it could be a primary or secondary cause of acute liver failure. Uh, in acute liver failure, drug induced uh, can be common. Uh, acute viral hepatitis, toxin induced, blood carry syndrome, autoimmune, or pregnancy related. These are the cases whereby emergency transplant may be an option. Although Wilson we consider as acute liver disease, uh, in this ESA guideline, they consider that uh, they, they still can consider that as a prominent presentation of Wilson disease will treat it like an acute liver failure. Similarly, autoimmune liver disease, blood carry, heavy reactivation. They they uh, easily suggested to treat is like uh, uh acute liver failure whereby uh whereby you may need to consider emergency uh liver transplant early. Other causes of uh, acute liver failure like ischemic hepatitis, hemophagocytosis, lymphoma infection, these are not a candidate for liver transplant. So this uh in terms of workout. You know, at admission, of course, you want to look for any infection that can precipitate and worsen the liver condition. X-ray, uh, you know, ultrasound of the liver, ECG, make sure resuscitate the, you know, airway breathing and circulation are good. Make sure urine output is okay. Make sure patient don't have hypoglycemia. Electrolytes is normal. If not, it may precipitate the cerebral edema. It may precipitate the, the the encephalopathy, you know, uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis uh, may be important as well because they are at risk of getting stress ulcer. No need to transfuse any, uh, you know, uh, clotting factors like uh, you know, FFP also unless there's acute bleeding. NAC and acetylcysteine uh, is is recommended to give early, even in uh, non uh, paracetamol cases. You know, preventive measure like avoid hepatotoxic medication, nephrotoxic drugs, avoid sedative. In hepatic and cephalopathy patient, in liver center, you know they will you know by right should uh, you know admit to ICU. Uh, then uh, may you know transfer to a, a liver center. Uh, elevate the the bed a bit. Uh, may even ventilate or sedate. Uh, you know in, in certain. Uh, patient. Okay, who are the patients that uh, you should call up uh, Dr. Tan in uh, Salaya? So, uh, you know, in paracetamol, you may want to consider those with, you know, acidosis, like pH 7.3 or bicarb less than 18, coagulopathy, you know, or, uh, you know uh, with AKI already, uh, hepatic NKF, hypoglycemia, or persistent elevated lactate, you want to call them early so that they will know, uh, they will prepare a bed and you know they may need to work out for a, a transplant donor or candidate or cadaveric uh, liver. In non paracetamol, also acidosis, IR, AKI, uh, and CAF, uh, very highish bilirubin and shrinking liver size. Of course, the criteria to consider for liver transplant, um, a lot of people will use the King's College criteria. ALF due to paracetamol, there will be slight difference compared uh, the paracetamol and non-paracetamol acute liver failure. So you want to send it uh, before the patient uh, you know, achieve this uh, severe condition. You want, uh, what I mean is you want to send it to the uh, hepatology center before patients uh, uh, develop into the severe condition 
whereby it's beyond salvageable already. Then another case uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, TCH no comorbid was referred to our, our medical team for incidental deranged liver function test after a neurosurgical operation for meningioma. He was also started of a capra for as a uh, seizure prophylaxis. He, he told that his, he has a family issue of liver disease, brother passed away due to liver cancer, but not sure what is the etiology of liver cancer. Otherwise, he has no stigmata or chronic liver disease, abdomen is soft non tender. Blood test is all uh, normal initially, full blood count, and even initially, only some derangement. Uh, for example, ALT, AST is raised, bilirubin was normal, but subsequently, patient developed jaundice. Uh, bilirubin become 300 and INR deranged. Ultrasound normal. HBS was found to be positive. Call IgM, anti call IgM was negative. Call IgG was positive, suggests that possibly this patient has already chronic hepatitis B, which he's not aware of. The hep B DNA is really high, and subsequently he developed ascites and encephalopathy. So this patient, uh, you know, according to the latest guideline from the APASO, the Asia Pacific guideline, this is considered as acute on chronic liver failure with patient underlying chronic hepatitis B, although he's unaware of it, precipitated probably precipitated by a drug induced liver injury. So next, just briefly about acute on chronic liver failure. Why is it important? Because this Acute ACLF is associated with high 28-day mortality. The mortality rate can be as high as, you know, like an acute liver failure. Therefore, action should be taken very fast and even refer to a hepatology center early rather uh, and urgently rather than wait. ACLF, it's an acute hepatic insult manifesting as jaundice. According to the APASO guideline, will be the bilirubin of more than 85 and coagulopathy INR more than 1.5 complicated within 4 weeks by clinically ascites and or have encephalopathy in a patient with previously diagnosed or undiagnosed chronic liver disease or compensated cirrhosis. So this is the guideline. Uh, back in 2019, at the moment, I think this this paper has been cited like, like, like thousands of times already. So, which is one of the common uh, guidelines that people uh, quote on. So, acute on chronic liver failure, when you compare to acute decompensation of a, a chronic liver disease or liver cirrhosis. So, a lot of time ACLF, you can identify the precipitants like medication, uh, hepatotoxic medication, alcohol or so. Time to insult the presentation usually is shorter within four weeks. Um, may or may not have cirrhosis. If cirrhosis, it will be a compensated cirrhosis. And this is an index decompensate, uh, index uh, liver failure. It cannot be like a had multiple episodes uh, of, of decompensation before. Those we consider as decompensation uh, chronic liver disease. Okay, in this ACLF, it's only the index case we consider that as a ACLF. And the mortality is high. Can at one month and three months, it can be as high as 50%. And if we treat it uh, very uh, on time and, uh, and, and well, and patient has a chance of good recovery. So in ACLF, uh, briefly, they use this uh, ARC score, ARC score. If less than 10, uh, they can just try some specific therapy uh, or so supportive medical therapy. Uh, for example, in a case whereby uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol hepatitis uh, in ACLF may consider steroids if the MADRI score is more than 32. Hepatitis B case, usually we will use either antacarbia or tenophobia, AIH steroids, uh, DLE like plasma exchange, Wilson plasma exchange, and even uh, NAC in, in, in certain uh, and, and most of the cases. Of course, if the ARC score is very high, you know, you may want uh, without any 
uh, target organ damage, you may want to consider liver transplant early. Of course, uh, we ask for as low, but it doesn't respond later on, you may also want to consider liver transplant. Of course, with a condition of uh, many organ failure, likely is not going to recover despite the organ support or bridge therapy, then maybe this will be uh, futile, uh, may not be suitable for transplant. So they give a, a good algorithm uh, for us to have a certain target. By day four, you need to achieve certain things. Day seven, you need to achieve certain things. If you don't achieve it by then, then you have to move on and plan for transplant. So ARC score, what are the components? Bilirubin, hepatic and calf, INR, lactate, and creatinine. And based on the score, uh, total of score, you can grade it into grade one, two, three, and uh, you can plan ahead or, or uh, they, they, they suggest an algorithm to, to for, for, for the management. So do, do go in into the website to, uh, to, to download this paper. It's very interesting and very informative. Case 3, a retiree, uh, underlying diabetes, hypertension, alcohol use disorder, stopped three years ago, presented with abdominal distension and bilateral swelling, similar episodes two months ago. Ascites is present as evidenced by shifting downwards positive. And I think you all can also predict that uh, what case is this. You see, bilirubin is high, albumin is low, AST is more than ALT, INR is deranged. So, Recurrent episode, so this is a decompensated chronic liver disease with portal hypertension with underlying alcoholic liver disease. So this is my uh, next uh, focus, decompensated chronic liver disease. Chronic liver disease definition, progressive deterioration of liver function for more than 28 weeks. If liver cirrhosis is usually a pathological diagnosis, uh, uh, okay, so this is the paper that uh, we have published not too long ago, uh, looking into our trend of our patients that come to our center lah, uh, clinic, uh, our secondary care. So just to give you all uh, an idea, what are the cases that present uh, to, to our clinic? I suppose it's not too different compared to other hepatology clinic and other centers in Malaysia. So uh, we found that uh, most common cause with liver disease are hepatitis B infection. We have collected about 2,000 plus patients, actually 4,000 plus patients, including uh, gastroenterology cases, uh, but predominantly our patients are liver more. So uh, about 44.4% have B, and uh, nephro D, last time we still use nephro D, about 39.3%, which is a lot as well. The rest are like hepatitis C, uh, drug-induced, uh, autoimmune disease, alcoholic liver disease, Wilson, and etc. Not which is not too many. Lah. DDC, PSC as well. But we zoom into the disease to see how many per, uh, uh, with a percentage of uh, liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. We found that actually more common is patients with nephrod. Up to 18% of the uh, nephrod patients has liver cirrhosis, much more than hepatitis B, you know. And of course, the numbers are uh, nephrod is much more than the rest. So, in other words, you know, have we nowadays, if we detect early, we have good treatment, uh, usually you can control the disease to prevent uh, progression into cirrhosis and even prevent uh, HCC. Whereas <laughs> nephrody at the moment don't have a, a FDA approved medication and you know with the epidemic of obesity uh, in this region and globally, so nephrody or nephrody has grown into uh, big problems. So you all have to have a lower threshold uh, to screen for uh, nephrody or methody and prevent them from developing cirrhosis or so on. In particularly, uh, you know, need to screen patients with diabetes, obesity, overweight patients, or those with metabolic uh, factors. Clinical cause of liver cirrhosis usually from 
compensators should see the compensators it occurs at the rate of five to seven percent. But of course, depending on each etiology and whether the etiology is under control or not. Uh, so the compensatorosis is a systemic disease with multi-organ dysfunction. Late decompensation can cause ascites and calf jaundice infection, you know, hepato uh, renal syndrome, etc. We classify and prognosticate the patient based on a uh, child uh, score with a component of NCAF, ascites, bilirubin, albumin, and INR. All right, this is my final case. I uh, just want to share that uh, before I join gastro, uh, as a physician, as a medical officer, as a houseman, you know, these are the typical cases that we have seen and perhaps we really misdiagnosed them. So Mr. Zach, ex-policeman, presented with fever for three days, just came back from swimming in nearby waterfall one week ago, which is our one of our medical favorite questions. A patient also has some mild abdominal pain, which we may brush it off. And patient has jaundice, clinical ill, septic looking, BP 110 and over 70, pulse rate 110. Abdomen, some mild tenderness, not specific, no guarding. Total wise, uh, definitely raised 18. Liver function, bilirubin 30, uh, 62. Uh, mixed, you know, cholestasis and hepatocellular injury, ALP 380, ALT 200. I am still okay. Of course, we were sent for HEP B, HEP A, HEP C as well. Ultrasound, we will definitely do it. And it just show cholelithiasis, no biliary dilatation. You know, our previous favorite uh, serology test, uh, leptospirosis serology, remain pending. So what do you think is the uh, possibility? Any other clinical suspicions you want to, you want to think of? Okay. I mean, in the past, we may thought that this is just severe sepsis due to leptospirosis or, or other things. But in fact, uh, with the presence of abdominal pain, with the presence of ultrasound abdomen or cholelithiasis, we really have to think of whether could this be a post-hepatic cause of jaundice? Could, the, could this be a ascending cholangitis or not? So in this situation, uh, really... And this is true, true enough. Um, so uh, I mean, this case is a real case that we, we encounter. So uh, because of the clinical suspicions of uh, you know biliary obstruction is high, although ultrasound uh, never show there's any dilated uh, common bowel duct or never show any uh, stones in the common bowel duct. So, but the clinical suspicion is still high. So we proceeded with a uh, uh, endoscopic ultrasound. True enough, we found a stone in the CBD, and you know it caused biliary uh, obstruction. So we proceeded with a uh, uh, ERCP and removed the stone, and of course we put in a stand because it's quite severe disease and ascending cholangitis. So and patient recover well. Imagine if we miss it. You know, we were treated with antibiotic. We thought that this is leptospirosis or, or other disease. Then, you know, without the relieving the biliary obstruction, uh, without relieving the ascending cholangitis, you know, uh, patient may uh, progress and also die uh, from it. So, I mean, of course, uh, in the center of, of Dr. Tan and, and, and myself, Usually, we will you know, proceed with doing a EUS and followed by ERCP if it's truly a ascending cholangitis. But in your center, whereby you don't have the EUS service or also, of course, you can do a CT scan and even MRCP if possible, uh, if the clinical suspicion is high. You know, especially you see presence of abdominal pain, you know, cholelithiasis uh, on ultrasound. Okay, so in summary, I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I'm, I didn't waste your time. Hopefully, what I present is beneficial to you all. I just want to summarize everything that I've taught, uh, I've mentioned. So, John, this we really have to divide it into prehepatic cause, mainly hemolysis, uh, 
and even Wilson disease, not to forget. Uh, okay, hepatic cause, whether intrahepatic cholestasis or just hepatocellular uh, injury, and also post hepatic cause. Then, uh, my final slides. Okay, so approach to abnormal liver function test, usually the initial investigation, you will do a liver function test, synthetic function of the liver, including INR, full blood count, HBS antigen, NTHCV, HEP A, IgM, TDM, PCM, of course, you know, thyroid history, ultrasound, look for biliary obstruction and fatty liver. Second line, you may want to send autoimmune antibody, uh, you know, uh, ANA, IgG level, anti-SM antibody, AMA, uh, iron studies, serum seroplasmin, and well, I hope you all can see, uh, CT scan, MRCP, or consider EUS in those that is relevant. Okay, this is from the British Society guidelines. Uh, you, in the, uh, just to give us a guide, uh, in hepato, if liver, uh, for those with abnormal liver function, so uh, again, I've mentioned already, uh, blood test, ultrasound, head B, head C, autoantibody, ferritin. Important synthetic function. Huh? If presence of abnormal synthetic function like John Lee's low uh, albumin or INR or suspect malignancy, they suggest that urgent referral, you see. Those in red is urgent referral to a specialized center. Isolated raised bilirubin with otherwise normal liver function test. You may suspect that this is just Gilbert syndrome. Those with isolated cholestatic liver enzyme, you know, if your center only have ALP, ALP waste can be due to bone or cholestasis. So you may want to add on a GGT and C. Of course, John uh, bilirubin high, then you know that this is definitely cholestatic. Lah. Otherwise, in most centers that has ALP and GGT, then more or less you can know that this is a liver cause rather than bone related. Then you want to do imaging like ultrasound and even consider CT scan, MRCP, EUS if possible. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, kind attention. I'm happy to accept any question. And Dr. Tan, um, yeah, I'll pass back to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cha, for providing us with a very comprehensive and insightful overview of the non-surgical jaundice. Perhaps I would say as a pre-herpetic, intra-herpetic, and also the post-herpetic jaundice are now. And actually, your expertise has given us a valuable insights into the causes, diagnosis, and the treatment of the uh, causes of jaundice. So for our audience, if you have any questions or if there is any specific area that you would like to delve deeper in, please feel free to ask. So actually, I see a few questions in the chat box. Um, the first question is, I would like to ask if the term primary biliary cirrhosis and primary biliary cholangitis is, is used interchangeable. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Courtney uh, Tang, for your uh, uh, nice question. So usually nowadays, they prefer more of primary biliary cholangitis rather than primary biliary cirrhosis as not all patients with PBC has cirrhosis already. So some of them uh, only, so you want to detect them early even before the phase of cirrhosis. But I guess... Um, Clinically, we still use it quite interchangeably, but nowadays they, I think they recommend more of a, yeah, primary delivery cholangitis. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Doctor Chua, for the uh explanation. And actually, there there is other questions in the chat box. Uh, thanks, Prof Chua, for your informative presentation. I would like to ask. According to King's College criteria of non-PCM induced ALF, why one of the liver transplant criteria is age less than 10 or more than 40 only? What about age between 40 to 40 years of age? Oh, okay. You see, uh, you see, uh, this is uh, this is one of the 
criteria. Uh, this is for non DCM. This is one of the criteria only. So if you fulfill three out of the five following criteria, whereby if age is less than 10 or age more than 40, they tend to progress, uh, you know, uh, progress, the disease tend to progress and worsen uh, without liver transplant. So if this criteria associated with other criteria like the etiology uh, on in, uh, undetermined, drug-induced, or the interval jaundice, which is more than seven days to hand careful party, and be more than 300 or INR 3.5 and above, if any of the criteria fulfill three out of five, is uh, then uh, you know King's College, uh, the criteria suggested should go for uh, liver transplant. Whereas 10 to 40 years of age, they are not one of the criteria uh, to you know that need a urgent liver transplant. Of course, in those with 10 to 40 years with a BWB of more than 300, INR more than 3.5 and other criteria, then definitely they fulfill the criteria for a liver transplant also. Okay. Uh, thank you for shedding light on this aspect. Uh, there's another question in the chat box. Uh, hello, doctors. How do we differentiate between acute or chronic liver disease Acute on chronic liver failure, I think, and acute decompensated uh, chronic liver disease. Maybe I can take this uh, question. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, actually, I'm talking this according to the PASER uh, guideline. La. So um, if you see Dr. Chua's uh, slides just now, the definition of acute on chronic liver failure is defined as uh, that is a jaundice where the total bilirubin will be more than uh, 85 together with uh, co coagulopathy with the INR of less than, uh, of more than 1.5. Then after that, uh, the patient develop uh, hepatic encephalopathy or ascites within 28 days after the, uh, after the jaundice with the underlying diagnosed or undiagnosed uh, chronic liver disease. After that, uh, the patient has a very high uh, motility in this group. So usually uh, for patients with chronic liver disease and the patient has drawn this first, will precede the hepatic and calf and the ascites in acute on chronic liver failure. Whereas in the acute decompensation, they can present in many ways. For example, the patient can just have a ascites without jaundice or hepatic and calf or combination of jaundice with ascites or combination with jaundice and hepatic encephalopathy. And for the patient with acute decompensation, usually they have the prior decompensation. While in acute and chronic liver failure, the decompensation, I mean the ascites and the hepatic, hepatic encephalopathy usually occur the first time. And for the acute insult, for the acute on chronic liver failure, the acute insult usually is the hepatic causes, for example, like the hepatitis reactivation of the hepatitis B. And whereas the acute decompensation, the acute insult can be due to other causes uh, other than the hepatic uh, causes. So, um, and SELF carries a very high mortality, about 33 to 39%, whereas the acute decompensation carries a, a much lower mortality compared to the SELF. I hope uh, this answer your questions and hope you can differentiate both SELF and the uh, acute decompensation in the future. Very well said, uh, Dr. Tan. I mean, he has summarized everything very nicely. So essentially, you know, I think the, the important thing to differentiate ACLF and also decompensation is because, you know, number one, as Dr. Tan said, the mortality is high. If we take action correctly and fast enough, many of the patients or even half of it will have complete recovery or reversal, you know. Whereas in acute decompensation, although the short-term mortality is not that high, you know, 
usually uh you know the recovery may not be you know for example already the compensated coronary liver disease you you know Charles B Charles C already you can't expect them to go back to you know uh non cirrhotic or Charles A condition you know a lot of time they will still remain the same and the mortality short term is may not be as high most of the time they are index cases in acute or chronic uh liver failure whereas the compensation very rightly said by Dr. Tan, it's really, you know, recurrent decompensation and decompensation. Keep on coming to us uh, every few weeks, few months, like that. Yeah. Um, actually, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. And Dr. Chua, I would like to ask, actually, what are the challenges in diagnosing non-surgical jaundice in your clinical practice? Thank you, Dr. Tan. Very, you know, excellent question. I mean, these are the things that, uh, you know, last time when we were working together, uh, and also as a, you know, a physician, as a MO, as a houseman, we always have this problem of to diagnose uh, medical jaundice. Sometimes it's challenges is we cannot 100% uh, rule out the hepatic uh, and post hepatic cause, you know, rather than immediately. Sometimes they have mixed picture of a uh, uh, race cholestasis and also hepatocellular injury. We really need imaging to help us, and you know the radiology not helping us. They you know they don't want to grant the CT scan. Your well, ultrasounds can be very subjective. Um, you know, uh, it's like operator dependent. Uh, so we have challenges to order the test. Uh, even here, you know, to get a CT scan sometimes can be challenging. Uh, it will delay, delay. So sometimes, you know, we have the luxury of we can do EUS, you know, we go straight away, put in the scope and we can find out, oh, really, truly, is it a stone or not? Yeah. You know, we don't have to depend on them. But otherwise, in other centers, to get an imaging, quite difficult. And of course, in KKM, I understand that, you know, sometimes we want to order the autoimmune studies, also difficult. You know, when the time the result came back, you know, patient may deteriorate already and miss out in follow up, etc. I, I can see that these are the, I feel that the challenges that I can imagine that I faced in the past and, and, and currently. How about yourself, uh, Dr. Tan? What are the challenges you think? <laughs> um, actually, both uh, as a gastroenterologist and a hepatologist, actually, most of the time we are interested in interested in this intrahepatic and also the uh, hepatic intrahepatic and also the post hepatic uh, jaundice and uh, i think the initial interpretation of the liver function test is very important um for example let's say if you see the um indirect hyperbilirubinemia and actually most sometimes we uh, we still uh, receive some referral of jaundice, which is the indirect hyperbilirubinemia. And let's say if we see these cases, then we will also need to investigate from the beginning, and then we will need eventually need to refer to the hematologist if this is a hemolysis or any a hematological uh, condition. I think this would this would delay the diagnosis and also the. Uh, treatment of the patient. So therefore, I think interpretation initially is very important. And I also found that most of the time uh, during the investigation, then we would just stop at the uh, viral hepatitis, drugs, and also the uh, ima imaging. So actually, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, investigation that we can uh, do for the uh, investigation of the cholestasis uh, uh, jaundice. If you are interested, I think I recommend you can uh, read the ESA uh, guideline to look for the flow of the cholestasis uh, jaundice. And uh, sometimes um, these are the uh, investigation that we always uh, do to, to reach the diagnosis. Uh. And I would say 80 to 90% we can uh, reach the diagnosis based on the uh, flow chart, but uh, 10% of the cases, 
probably less than 10% of the cases is still unable to reach the uh, diagnosis. And the challenges is just, uh, we have to wait for the patient to deteriorate and then eventually liver transplant and we couldn't give the uh, treatment for this group of patients. Uh. So even though uh, we are uh, considered quite advanced in the diagnosis and also the investigation of the cholestasis uh, jaundice nowadays. Yeah, it's true. So sometimes they, these kind of challenges, uh, including even after liver biopsy, you may not you know, even identify the cause. Huh? So yes. liver biopsy is one of the the, the 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 investigation that need to be considered if we really cannot find. But as what Dr. Tan said, still have cases that it, despite liver biopsy, we still uncertain. Yeah. Um so I think I didn't see any more questions in the uh, chat in the chat box. And also the question answer uh, area. Uh, Kelvin, do you have any questions? Uh, actually, I want to ask one question on behalf of our colleague. Uh, uh, I want to know whether there's a role of uh, giving NAC for uh, uh, non-drug uh, uh, related, means non dv cases like uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Any experience on this? NAC. Mm. Okay. So, so far, I think NSC, the indication is for uh, paracetamol toxicity and also the acute liver failure. Uh, and there's some uh, very minimal study, minor study in the uh, ischemic hepatitis, but still need a larger study to confirm the evidence on it. Uh, other than that, uh, I think the NSC uh, usage is not that evidence uh, base. So what is your opinion, Dr. Chua? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Paracetamol and non-paracetamol uh, daily that is associated with acute liver failure or acute on chronic liver failure. Yeah, I think we can consider. But otherwise, uh, without acute liver failure and non-paracetamol, usually we don't give love uh, unless it's acute liver failure. Of course, if uh, the situation of Hep B, of course, your antiviral is more effective. Then uh, in a situation of autoimmune hepatitis, your steroids definitely is more effective. You know, and even sometimes uh, plasma exchange uh, for those very severe acute liver failure uh, while waiting for to consider liver transplant or so. Mm. So you have I mean, for those that we are uncertain of what the, what is the cause of uh, acute liver failure, some a lot of time we will give NAC as well. Uh, of course, including the paracetamol and uh, non-paracetamol, paracetamol DD. But again, we have we have to try to identify. We have to try. Oh, okay. We have to try to identify what is the etiology and treat accordingly as well. Tackle the etiology as well. That will be uh even more effective. Uh. Kevin, uh, the uh, did we answer your question? Oh, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, I didn't see any more questions in the chat box. So, if there's no more questions, let's express our gratitude once again to Dr. Chua for an enlightening section and thank you uh, for your active participation. And we look forward to future engaging discussion on the medical topics. And Have a great day, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Chua. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. And thank you, Kelvin, for the kind invitation as well. Thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.